American. That's, that's all they knew that they wanted. They could talk North African all they wanted. They, nobody was into authenticity at that point. Um, and so I made the best decision because what I did was I went in there and I happened to do this kind of voice that came straight off of doing Shakespeare in front of 1,800 people on top of this thing. And that's why she's sort of very plummy and round, you know. Mrs. Professor Xavier Sauron has manipulated Rhodes' mind. What is North African about that? <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because you have, to, you have to listen to your director, you have to listen to your casting director. A lot of the time they know exactly what it is that they want, sometimes they don't. <laughs> and sometimes you can give them something else. And, and actually I shouldn't really say that because the casting director with Storm obviously knew what they wanted, but it was not what they were putting out there. Because they were telling you about this woman who came from North Africa. One would imagine then that you would want a North African accent. Mm -hmm. Not true. But, and I didn't know a whole lot about cartoons. It's just that I hadn't seen them. Uh, uh, so that's how I got into the business. The other shock for me was, um, so I get this role, and I'm kind of excited about it, but... Luckily for me, I was so on the outside of these things, because I think if I realized that I had gotten this absolutely fantastic role that, you know, people were going to be geeks the world over. I mean, I got fan mail from across the planet. I said on this, this uh, blog interview that I did, it was a, you know, Ayatsi Cruz, and, you know, these are men who work on film sets, and they really don't give two swift walk-ups about actors. Um, <laughs> actors are all spoiled children. If we could make movies without them, that would be good. They've got cable to coil, things to do. Men got serious things to do. And men would drop cable and then find out that I was torn. Yeah, <laughs> no, for real. That's cool, man. And, you know, and men just talking. So it was, it was, but luckily for me, see, I didn't know. For me, it was another gig. I had, this was, that would have been 1992, so I had two kids. I was a single parent. I was in the most precarious business that exists on the planet, right? You can make, um, $8,000 one month, but if you don't work again for the next six months, that 8000 is run over real, real quick. You have, you have no idea where your next dollar is going to come from. I mean, I know some of you in here are entrepreneurs, so you know what it is. I wasn't an entrepreneur. I was a professional, but a professional in a very precarious business. What I, I always say that it's, it's interesting because I was regarded as a successful working actor. They would trot me out all the time. There weren't that many successful black actors in the 1990s who were actually able to do the whole gamut that I was able to do, which was stage, film, television, and um, voiceovers for animation. And a lot of the time, I didn't know where my mortgage was coming from one month to the next but that constitutes success, so that's something interesting to keep in mind. Um, what else can I tell you about the, the business? After that, um, so I didn't, I didn't know enough, so I just went in there and I did what I did. The shock was I was sure that I was going to be working with other actors. I don't know anything about animation, but I mean at this point, it's, it's you know, I started being a professional actor in 1981. I was a card-carrying union member by 1987, and this is 1992. So I've got a lot of experience behind me now, and I know how it works. I've done my share of radio dramas. I'm gonna go into a space, and there's gonna be all these other actors there, and I'm gonna get, you know, we'll all work together and feed off each other's energy, and it's gonna be great. And when I went in, it was just me and the microphone. Mm -hmm. And you just go down the queues one after the other, and it is all self-generated. And there's a director on the other side of the screen, just going, let's take that again, let's take that again, let's take that again. I remember the scariest thing that ever happened to me, and that we were literally, we must have been um, in like season four. I'd done so many of these things, and it was the scariest thing that had ever happened, so we worked in the morning, and this was a long session, we had lunch, and I was coming back and Storm left the building. I could not find her. 
you don't ever want to be in that position. She just, I couldn't find her. I couldn't, and nobody took me, nobody took it seriously. And it was just like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, stop playing, so I'll place her. And then the director's telling me where in my chest to place her, and I couldn't find her. They had to let me go home. <laughs> it was just the strangest thing, so it does, it does happen. The character just left the room. I mean, at that point, I was doing more than one. The, the, the beauty about being in the business was when my life was exciting, it was really exciting because you could be, I could be doing theater during the day, have come home and have three sets of sides that I have to prepare for auditions coming up the next day. So and one would be a voiceover one and then there'd be some children's series and it was just keeping, to this day, it is why I don't remember stuff. I, don't, I won't remember your name. I came up with a way to wipe my slate clean. There was no other way for me to be able to keep all of the lines in my head. There were just too many of them. Shakespeare and this thing and, and Delilah and Julius and all the rest of it all going at the same time and all of these are things that you have to prepare the night before to go in there while you've still got the character that you're working on in your head. Um, voice acting is it's one of it was one of my favorite things to do mostly because you didn't have to prepare for it. You didn't have to get the makeup on, you could get on, I mean, basically if, you, if I wanted to leave Scarborough and come down to Toronto in my pajamas, nobody would have blinked an eye as long as my instrument was working in the morning. And it was just no fuss. No fuss, no bother, no nothing. No, no, you don't have to get into even relationships with people that early in the morning. It's just you and the voice director. That's it. But I was really lucky I got to do some, some as Victor was saying, there were there were some fantastic things. There's still some. I go on IMDb myself sometimes to <laughs> figure out what the hell it was that I have done. Um, and they don't even have all of them because uh, one of the when I was trying to get a hold of some scripts, this one I'd forgotten about completely. Artopia, which was an, an Emmy award-winning um, series, animated series for kids, and they only ever did. It was public television out in New York. And they only ever did one season of it because it was just so expensive to produce. And I played the Aztec serpent, and I went, oh yeah, from Mexico. What <laughs> <laughs> about her? She was cool. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about, because one of the questions that's down here, and I was hoping that we could have a bit of a conversation about it, is. Um, what does it take to be a voice actor? And I mean, on the end, because what, what's what's cool about what what uh, Melissa and Omar have managed to do with today is that you've got somebody who has been on one side of the table in that I audition and do the work, and then you have the people here who produce and who are looking for any time that the the usual kinds of things that I used to hear all the time were power and warmth. So apparently, that's what my voice has power and a certain kind of warmth. So that's where you're gonna stay. Except that every now and again, these really cool ones, so I play tons and tons of them until they, they get boring. And then every now and again, you get a really cool one, like the baby bird, or and I played a little eight-year-old boy by the name of Cleon um, on Monster by Mistake. He had a little pet or something and he used to turn into a monster. <laughs> and Cleon was this little, this, this dude. And he was kind of neat too. And you, you, you really, like, you hope for those ones because those are the ones that just let you go out there. The other thing that you should know, and you guys would all be better at that than me, is to be up on your pop culture references. I would be so lost. Because I would go in there and they'd be throwing these things at me. Well, you know, no, we're thinking that she's um, she's a little bit of, you know, and a little bit of that. And I'm going, I have no idea who you know <laughs> or the other buddy is. Don't have a clue. But obviously, if this is your world, if this is how you think that you're going to be able to make money, then you need to know who Donald Duck and Minnie Mouse are. I'm reaching way back, but <laughs> you need to know who they are so that when somebody tells you when you've been doing something down here and you're pretty sure that you've got Auntie first, you know who she is, and they go, oh, no, 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 Minnie and Donald. You can, 
<laughs> dig down into your repertoire and know exactly what it is that so they're doing. One of the things that we like to do, but we need you for it, is if you're going to come to a voice actor's workshop, there's no point having voice actors just sit and talk to you all the time about what it's like to be a voice actor. What you have to do is get a feel for what it's like. So, with your permission, I want to know how many people gathered here would be game if I gave out a couple of scripts and we said we would have some people come up here and do like a group audition. So what's going to happen is I'm going to feed you um, some, I'm going to tell you what the stories are. We can look at Delilah and Julius, which is a Canadian, a completely Canadian um, thing. We'll look at Artopia, which is an American one. It came out of public television in New York. I'll tell you about the series. I'll tell you about some of the characters. We'll give you some sides. We'll give you two minutes to look them over. You'll get up here. You'll do them. We'll listen. We'll give you some feedback. We'll let Mommy do what she does in an audition, which would be to give, and I'm hoping that Victor will feed in. I'll feed in, we'll see how you change it up, and then we'll move another group through. Y'all willing to do it? Um, yeah. I'm just gonna read the very beginning. I'm not gonna read the, the in-between ones, but... So, they're little, the, the little six-year-old, He's scaling the wall of the castle. He's jumping lightly from the head of one gargoyle to the other. Um, at some point, y'all should take a look at these scripts. I have seen scripts that people are writing for animation. They do not include enough stage directions. All we ever do is write the um, dialogue. Think like a camera. Uh, so he's scaling the wall of the castle, jumping lightly from the head of one gargoyle to another. And as he does, the last two gargoyles come to life, growling at him. And then we see where Streak gets his name. He becomes a blur, streaking up the side of the castle, faster than the eye can see. He grabs a little out of the way, just as the gargoyles lunge for him, smashing into each other instead. Ow! <laughs> what is that big idea? Whoops, too slow. this morning, orange, tusk, polka dots. Ah, oui. But when I got a lot of this big horn on my head, he ran around crying, wah, wah, to mommy. <laughs> Pierre, do you think he was scared to win? He ran because he could, because he got a good look see of my big teeth and eyes. I can't do a war. That's when he said adios, amigos. And where are you from? I mean, I thought gargoyles were French. The good ones are. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, for the French artists, French artists won't be only ones to create monsters, protect their buildings. Me, I am an Aztec servant, proud from Mexico. That guy over there, mm, he's a tight dragon. Is he delicious? Yes, we're from all over. But it's the exaggerated pictures my artist gave me that scares the monster away. Check out the size of my French horns. <laughs> Since when has anyone been afraid of girls? Not even if they're French.